when they were coming they brought along guns gunpowder spirituals liquors trinkets among others and exchanged these for gold ivory later on the other spices now one major thing the portuguese were interested in was gold incidentally the locals were giving them so much so they came to believe the town would be full of gold and for that simple reason they called this place amina or damina meaning the mine in their language so it was this word that would not be pronounced properly and this word was corrupted to today's word elmina and invariably it became the name of the town there is another school of thought that suggests the arabs were the first to be here and seeing the place having a kind of a natural harbor or port they called the place almina meaning the port but the locals would believe the portuguese more than the arabs so they believe the portuguese damina gave El elmina to the town and not as the arabs suggest but that does not mean we never had a name before they came we did and our name was Anum Ansa. Anum Ansa literally means that when you drink, it doesn't get finished or inexhaustible kind of water. 1482, that's 11 years after the Portuguese had first come, led by their captain called Don Diego de Azambuja, the Portuguese came to see the chief of the town called Nana Kwamina Ansa, negotiator for this plot of land and had this huge edifice built. It is interesting to learn that the chief wasn't enthusiastic with the Portuguese intention initially to stay. He felt cultural differences was going to be a problem in the future. And just like a traditional ruler, he said that friends are better friends if they don't live together. But upon persuasions and assurances, he gave in. And this would be the first time in the history of the world a West African chief would legally transfer a title to a plot of land to an European, and for that matter, Portuguese. Materials for construction, most were imported, and the color of the brick will help us understand which side of the structure was built by the Portuguese and which side of it was done by the Dutch. All red bricks are Portuguese and all yellow bricks are Dutch. So with that, you can easily identify the places that were, were built by the Portuguese and the places that were built by the Dutch. But then the Portuguese will have two reasons why they, they built this castle or the dungeons. One, to trade. Two, give out rooms for the missionaries who were to come in to spread Christianity and when they came at first they were Catholics. From the very onset when they were into gold and ivory and others the rooms on the ground floor were being used as storerooms or warehouses as planned. But then from the 1500s it shifted gradually from gold and others to human trade and when this happened the rooms that were initially storerooms were then converted to holding places where the Africans were kept. At the peak of it, the whole structure would talk of a minimum of about a thousand at a time. 600 of them men, 400 women. One thing very, very difficult and everybody would like to ask a question on that would be the fact that yes, the Portuguese shifted from gold trade to human trade. But why? You have to understand processes by which somebody is made to serve another had been with all the races in the time past. So in that sense, the Africans in themselves had an idea before the foreigners came. But the system we had in our culture was not as the Europeans or the foreigners introduced. In fact, it is very difficult to use the word slave to describe that person under the system we had in place before the foreigners came. 
In fact, to even suggest the person is an indentured servant, to me, is again difficult. But we can make it simple. The person should be seen as a servant. Because in most cases, that person had rights. He could marry, raise free kids, acquire properties, pay the price on his head, he'll be a free person. It was very difficult in most cases. Identifying that person from, from a regular person in the society, the servant from a regular person in the society. Why? Because he was clothed, fed, had shelter just like any other person. One thing that happened to the system that was even unique was the father, the so-called slave, could shift from that status to a royal status. How would that happen? One, when the man proved to have managerial ability or military skill, he could become the caretaker of the master's household. Descendants of such became royals. Women got married into the system. They ceased to be servants or slaves and from then had royal descendants. Some managed to shift from one community. They began a community for themselves and by that shift, they all became royals. And Ghana here and now, there are so many chiefs in the villages, communities, and towns whose ancestors were not royals. In fact, they even want to see them as slaves. But by hard work, marriage, or the shift, descendants all over are chiefs. And partly because of that, it becomes a taboo to refer to anybody as a slave. Indeed, to strengthen that institution, they will tell you that you do not point to where a person is coming from. That is to say, that if I tell you I am from Elmina, that ends the discussion. No problem. I dare say that but for the coming into being of this industry, issues concerning slavery and trade will not be talked about in our communities. Why? Because with the accounts, for example, there isn't any extended family system that wouldn't have a line or two which would not be part of it originally but brought in. So the, the mothers are the ones to continue with the generations. So in one generation where we have about 15 boys and two girls, that is to say that only two girls are those who are going to sustain the next generation. So then to make the system work, they will bring in girls from other side to beef up the family for the next generation. So these are the ones that were not part of it originally, but brought in. But they become part and parcel of the family. So much so, nobody points to them to say anything. So then, if this issue had not come up for discussion, you will not get people in our various communities discussing it because it's not a subject to be discussed. Everybody is part of the family. There were three basic ways one could become a servant before the foreigners came. One, you could talk of prisoners of wars. Two, those convicted for some offenses. Three, those who were given out as pawns for debts. Meaning that what? If you go and borrow, the time was due for you to pay. You don't have whatever it is to pay. You could let somebody go and serve. And the period under which the person serves, he or she will be seen to be a servant. Or worse situation, a slave. And this was already in the setup before the foreigners came. Again, I'm quick to let people know that much as we would agree the Portuguese got here first in 1471, is not in any way to suggest it was the first time they started taking Africans from West Africa. No, they were taking Africans long before they got here. The first time is said to be 1440, others will push it to 1441. Some said they had 10, others said they had 12, from a point that later on became known as Rio de Oro. Rio de Oro simply means river of gold, and this place should be somewhere up Senegal thereabout. To them, they had only one reason for taking the 10 or the 12, serving as a proof that they finally gotten in touch with the Africans. Interesting to learn 
Of the 10 or the 12 they took initially, three or so of them were said to be of noble background, therefore had to negotiate for them to be brought back. And in return for these three, they gave the Portuguese 10 people in their place. They got gold from there, and that will be the, the first time they will get gold from West Africa. Hence, they will call that particular spot where they got these, Rio de Ouro. Let us not forget, taking them to Portugal was only to serve as a proof that they've gotten in touch with the Africans. But when the prince saw them, he was happy for two reasons. One, some were to be educated to serve as interpreters for the Portuguese coming back to West Africa. And two, as they put it, the most intelligent ones to be trained to become missionaries to hasten the spread of Christianity here. But sadly, when they got settled, they never came back as intended or planned. They rather ended up in the palaces as slaves. And from that time, no other European came over here and went back without African captives. Making us understand, they started taking Africans 30 years before they first got to Elmina. And 41 years later, this was built. And that's more the reason why most people believe the Portuguese never built the castle only for gold and ivory and others, but also for human trade. Why? Because long before it was built, they're already taking Africans across. They try to let us understand that those who were taken to Portugal, Spain, were not treated the same way as Africans were being treated over here before they came. But then almost the same. And then the re religious ones would also say that, well, by taking the Africans there and making Christians out of us, they were then doing us a favor because by that, they save our souls and heaven comes in and all that. But the whole situation changed when the Spaniards got to the so-called New Deliveries. And they talk about the fact that not long after going there, silver and gold mines were opened. Sugar, tobacco, cotton plantations were established. Yes, they wanted the riches. They wanted the wealth. But they were not ready to work the hard way. So they subjected the natives to the work. And the story says, Spanish brutalities, overwork, and effects of European diseases decimated the indigenous population. So one man was actually accused, Bartholomew de las Casas, supposedly a Catholic missionary who was simply on the natives, suggested for us to be used. One school of thought suggests, he said what he said based on the fact that already doing the same work under similar climatic conditions, therefore better substitute. Another school of thought suggests he even said never has souls. And that really got my attention because not long before this time we had the souls they wanted to save. And few years later we lost it. How did we lose it? But you know, to prove him wrong or right, 15-12, 15-15, some Africans were taken from Spain, some say to Hispaniola, others say to Santo Domingo, where they were tried. And true to the man's word, these ones proved physical effect. In fact, it was established that one African in strength was to fall the natives. So then demands for Africans then started. And that came as the beginning of that unfortunate story. The story of misery and pain. The story of the forced exodus of Africans from their motherland to different places they ended up all over the world. And this story became known as the transatlantic slave trade. The Europeans on their own physically could not have gone to all the various places to gather the Africans all by themselves. So broadly, three ways came out. One, the Europeans captured some people themselves. Two, they moved with Africans to gather Africans. Three, there were some Africans also who gathered people, brought them down to the so-called traders and from them to the Europeans. Is there one thing that brought in most? You could talk of inter-tribal wars. So the more we had wars, the more there were prisoners of wars 
and the more they were exchanged mostly for weapons. Some people do come in and they are kind of bold to say that Africans were giving out their own brothers and sisters. And you really want to tell them to, to shut up if they don't have anything else to say. Why? Because they are not in a position to define for us who a brother or a sister could be at the time. I tell people today, Africans all over the world ought to see themselves to be one. So then we can call ourselves brothers and sisters. But this mentality is recent. In the past, a brother or a sister was limited to a lineage, a tribe or a kingdom. And outside it, you were not seen to be one. And those of the same groupings that saw themselves to be one, therefore calling themselves brothers and sisters, 99.9% .9 cases never gave themselves out, but those of others. And these ones were not seen to be one, let alone thinking about brothers and sisters, for somebody to say that they had no conscience. No. I dare also say that if anybody would do a diligent study into the story, you must come to one conclusion. What would be the conclusion? The Europeans at the time were smart in one direction. What direction? In the ability to create a society that by itself would produce people without they not being involved physically. How? Ghana, for example, we can talk of three strong tribes. Talk of the Asantis, talk of the dangerous, talk of our Kwamu people. Now, these were fighting with others and making them part of them. At the Zenith, the Asantis defeated the dangerous. And Asante with the dangerous, Akwamu was never going to be a fight. So I tell people, Ghana could have become a kingdom, bigger and larger than today's Ghana. Asantehini most assuredly would have been the king, and Tree would have been the lingua franca. And with everybody speaking Tree and paying tribute to one king, it would be difficult for anybody to penetrate. So make that system work. Help smaller ones gain their independence from the larger ones. So then the more independent state created, the more the need will come for them to get the weapons to defend themselves. And the only way to get the weapons would be to bring in people. So you make it a principle. Divide already divided people and heighten insecurity. And that will fuel the system. Divide already divided people and heighten insecurity and that will bring in the people. Never forget this. Because dividing and conquering seems to persist in most of the African communities today. So, 1596, the Dutch will come in to attack the Portuguese, but they will fail. 1612, they had their fort built in a village about 25 kilometers from here called Mori. 1625, they will make another attempt on the castle to take over from the Portuguese, but again failed. In 1637, the locals became fed up with the Portuguese. Looking for saviors, they saw the saviors in the Dutch. What they saw in them, I still don't know. But they helped the Dutch through an inland route to the hill San Jago, where we have the fort. And from there, the Dutch attacked the Portuguese for the last time and took over. Sadly, when the Dutch came in, they were not the angels the locals were looking for. They rather extended the structures and took in more captives. 1807, English came out officially to stop the trade. 1814, the Dutch officially did the same. But those over here doing the actual thing never stopped. So from that time, what they called illegal trade got started. At the latter part of it, it was no more profitable. So on the 6th of April 1872, the Dutch and the English finally exchanged or swapped possessions. The Dutch gave theirs over here to the English, to that of the English in northern Sumatra in Indonesia. When the English took over, they used the, the structure for purely administrative matters. But of course, that doesn't mean they never took part in the trade. They did. However, at the time, the English were using the Cape Coast Castle for this. 
During the World War II, they brought men from all English-speaking West Africa, except Liberia, to this place. They trained them here. They took them to India and Burma, where they fought for them. These are the ones we call Royal West African Frontier Forces. After the Second World War, the castle was used as a police training school in 1948. So the English were in control until 1957, when Ghana would become an independent state and the English would be asked to go back home. So the structure as it stands is 536 years in the year of our Lord. The Portuguese were here for the first 155 years. The Dutch were here for 235 years. The English were in this particular one for 85 years. And Ghana being the last group, we've also been here for the last 61 years now, but we're still counting. So this will be a brief history into the background of the place. This became the female section of the castle. And here you're talking of 400 women in total at a time. One thing that happened over here that was particularly sad was the fact that when the Portuguese and the Dutch came over here to trade, most of them never came with their wives or their women. Why? They were dying of malaria and yellow fever to the extent the coastal line was even termed to be the white man's grave. But then in here, they could not stay without the women. So governors, soldiers, traders kept on abusing the women sexually in the dungeons. Whenever the governor wanted, because of his position, the story says, up on the balcony he stood and then ordered. Women were brought out from the dungeons all around to the courtyard. From there, he just looked through and then made his choice. This woman chosen could have been in the dungeons for a whole month, never cleaned her teeth, never took her bath or bath, gone through menses sometimes, and still the governor wanted. So the soldiers had the responsibility of making sure this woman was washed. How did they do it? They fetched water from the tank or the cistern. They washed the woman at the center of the courtyard Women from the dungeons looked on. After the humiliation, she was dressed up, given something to eat at least to be strong. Then up on these stairs, we call it private access to the governor's bedroom. This chosen woman was then taken to the governor. So the woman chosen after the humiliation out there was taken up these stairs through a door on top we call a trap door to the governor. After the governor had used her, she was brought back to the dungeons. Instances, the story will suggest that before she even got back, she could have been used by some other guys also. Some very few became mistresses and they stayed longer, and those that became pregnant were subsequently freed or liberated. We need to understand they came not only from today's what is known to be Ghana alone, but also from today's Togo, Burkina Faso, Cote d'Ivoire, even Nigeria sometimes. So when this woman was freed, she could not go back to where she came from. Secondly, the Europeans never wanted their babies to go anyhow. So some houses were then built here in town where those found pregnant were kept. When they delivered, the kids were brought back to the castle and they were educated. But then sadly, most of these were educated to be used as a bridge between the Africans and the Europeans. And also they gave out names to their kids. And that would be the beginning or the genesis of the European names along the coast. So now in Elmina, we are still having people calling themselves Da Costa, Da Silva, Vaness, Vroomsmith, 
Hutchison, Peterson, Youngson, Folson, Jefferson, Johnson, and all such names. the dungeons, the first thing you see them do would be to cover their noses. But I do tell them that no matter how bad it could smell today, no matter how stuffy it can get other times, is nothing to be compared to what was happening back then. Now the dungeon we are in now was the largest of the dungeons for the ladies. And this place had 100 to 150 people at a time. On the floor, as hard as you see it, they were packed or were sleeping. They were given food and water once, twice a day, a very little just to keep them alive. A month or two, they were held in here and mostly allowed out when the governor was going to pick one to be used. Over here also, they were not allowed to wash down. And women, some had to go through their menstrual periods and still be sleeping in it. The hole at the extreme end, among others, was for ventilation. Unfortunately, this was connected to a place they called magazine, where they kept ammunition. So whenever there was any leakage, the fumes or the chemicals just came straight to the dungeon and worsened the really bad situation. Here they were given two containers or receptacles. One was placed at the corners, where they were expected to go to ease themselves or go to the toilet and to them. But they talk about the fact that during the second month, they themselves became too weak, such that some, if not most, were unable to move from where they were to where the containers were to do it into them. So practically, they had everything on the floor and they were sleeping in it. Meaning that what we see today sometime past, had feces, urine, vomit, menstrual blood. And you seriously cannot underestimate the heat and the stench. And these, among others, explains why they were dying. And those that died were thrown into the sea. One question everybody would ask would be the fact that, yes, the trade was evil. But then if the ultimate was profit, then why let them die? It doesn't make sense. When you pursue this question, I can tell you for sure, you can never get a definite answer. There will be several suggestions. But two common ones you would get to be the fact that one, they were too strong to be controlled, so they wanted to be sure at all times they were weak, they couldn't fight back. And to kind of freeing themselves from the guilt, they developed another mentality that only those who could survive these were the strong ones who could then work. So it became a kind of a natural process of eliminating the weak ones. And by so doing, they were dying. Remember, those that died were thrown into the sea. In the year 2015, 48 Africans from all over the world came over here to put themselves in the conditions the Africans were subjected to. These 48 brothers and sisters first strip themselves, cover their private parts with those pieces of clothes you see down here. They put themselves back in chains and they stayed in this dungeon for 12 hours. Of the 12 hours, if anybody felt like using the bathroom, he had to do it on the floor, just as it happened. But you know what? Over the 12 hour period, nobody went to toilets in the dungeon, nobody vomited in the dungeon, we had no menstrual blood in the dungeon. The only urinated in the dungeon, and from urine alone, urine alone, we couldn't stay in this dungeon the next day for more than three minutes. So I began to tell people that no matter how hard anybody would tell the story, we would never be in the position to truly comprehend what they endured. What was the reason for the show? 
The organizer said Africans may not be in chains physically today, but mentally we could. So all this time he left this door representing knowledge, indicating that with knowledge one could step out of mental slavery. And incidentally, that is what Frederick Douglass said years ago, that knowledge makes a man unfit to be a slave. But what is said in the African communities? If you want to hide anything from an African, put it in a book because the African will not read. So I tell brothers and sisters who do visit that they should never forget they didn't just get to that situation. They were programmed to be in that situation. So the proof of your visit to the castle or a proof of your visit to the dungeons will be to inculcate the habit of reading. Otherwise, you are helping in perpetuating a crime. The women who had survived all these were put in chains. They were led down this way to the room there and from there to the last point in the process. We call this place the room of no return. So there they were given out to the boats and they were taken away. These bars were put there not long ago just to avoid accidents. Before there were stairs where they descended. But then now, because we are not using the water tank, we've made a drainage over here so that when it rains, water would collect in and then go away. We don't have to forget, in those days, husbands and wives were captured. In times of war, a whole family could be taken. Brought in here, they were separated. Women were up here, men were down there. All the time in the dungeons, they never saw each other. Most never saw each other again, and that was the end of it. For some few, they could see themselves down their house going, but there they couldn't talk to themselves. So they kept on crying and crying as they moved on. Don't forget also, a child below 10 was in most cases put together of an adult and sold together as a person. And those above 10 were sold as individuals. But then here, they never had a separate place where kids were kept. So boys were together with men, girls were together with the women. And you can imagine a girl below 10 years in the phases and enduring and all that. Most probably died in here before the ships even came. So this became the transit dungeon for the male captives. So when the ships had come, the men were taken from the dungeons on the other side to this. And then from here, they moved to the room of no return. But then this was the point some of the men got branded. You know branding? They put stamps in fire. They smear the point they want to mark with oil. Then they pick the stamp from the fire and stamp it right there. And people were dying from the shock or the pain of it. From here, the men moved in to join the ladies coming from the other end, and together they went to the room of no return. The next room was where the men and women met for the first time. Now I told you the people come, people could come from the same community and they would never see themselves. Husbands and wives could be captured. They would never see themselves after they've been brought to the dungeons. But sometimes when they were going, they could see themselves down here. But even here, they couldn't talk to themselves. So they kept on crying and crying as they moved on. At this point, they were not walking as freely as we are walking today. They had been put back in chains. The one was chained to the other, to the other, in the line of 5, 10, 15. 
and you cannot go as fast as you want. You can only move as fast as the chains will let you go. So slowly, they move. Meaning simply, nobody entered this room and went back from here to the boat, and that is it. What I normally tell people is this. In the life of a captive, life never got better. It only got worse. In other words, every stage will be more severe than the previous stage. So, walking down to the dungeons was difficult. Or painful but no matter how painful or difficult it could have been walking down it would be seen to be better compared to staying in the dungeons a month or two in your feces and enduring and all that it was brutal in the dungeons yet again better in the dungeons compared to the ships much worse you know this man called John Newton who is accredited with the song Amazing Grace he was one time a slave ship captain and this man was describing the interior of a ship and this is what John Newton would say. The Africans were chained two and two together. They were laid in two rows, one above the other on each side of the ship. They were close to each other like books on a shelf. He said, I have known them so close that the books on the shelf could not easily contain one more. And every morning, more instances than one, are seen of the living and the dead, chained together. One guy whose account made me very sad was Richard Drake. He was an Irish American. And with his experience, he said, On the eighth day out at sea, I went round the half deck, holding a camphor bag in the teeth, for the stench was hideous. I saw the sick and the dying chained together. I saw pregnant women giving birth to babies whilst chained to corpses because the drunken overseers had not gone in to remove them. Africans were literally jammed between decks as if in a coffin. And in a coffin in that dreadful hold became to nearly one half of our cargo before we reached Bahia in Brazil. Several others will let you know how very difficult it was going across the waters. In fact, it became more severe when they tried to take over the ship and failed much worse but you know what taken to the final destinations where they were then enslaved nothing could be compared to that so progressively it was worse when they were trading in gold and ivory and others the gate to the boat was from this point to this end however when this evil trade started they narrowed the exit to what you can see so that no one could escape one person at a time the narrow nature of the exit should not deceive us into thinking that probably they never brought fat people. They brought big, big people. But walking down the distance, staying here a month or two, by the time they got here, most could fit. The water at the time was touching the castle. Today it has receded. And experts are saying it is just because of the movement of the earth. So that is natural. Meaning that right after this, we had steps where they descended in chains to small boats. And the small boats carried them further into the ships. And through this and several others of this nature in Africa explains why today Africans as we are scattered all over the world. You look around, you could see flowers all over. Ghana, there is a festival called Pan-African Historical Festival. Now, whenever we have this festival, there's a program under it called Akwaba. Akwaba simply means welcome. So as we welcome everybody to the program, we remember the ancestors. By remembering them, we say all the prayers and after we leave reads. Normally we get three, one from the chiefs, one from the government, and one from all Africans in the diaspora. From this time round, anyone who visits and would like to light a candle or lay a wreath in memory of an ancestor is allowed to do so. And that explains why we have more than three over here today. 
Again, I try to let people know that those who refused to eat and they died, those who fought and were killed, those who jumped overboard and killed themselves, did what they did in protest. In other words, they protested with their lives. And those that survived the journey never survived only because they were strong. Indeed, you must be physically, mentally, spiritually strong to go through all these and still survive. But know what? That was not the only reason. These ones made up their minds to go through the pain, the shame, the degradation so they could tell the story. So once you have the opportunity to watch this, remember these ones and make a vow in you to do the little you can do in your own small way, making sure this evil will never again be repeated. So we had the leaders of these freedom fighters captured and put in there. They were denied food and water until death. And when anyone died, they just went in for the body, threw it into the sea. And the whole idea was for it to serve as a deterrent. Now what happened in there that was particularly sad was when somebody was there dead and the next person was there alive. Until the soldiers had entered for the dead, the one alive had no choice but to be with the dead body. And instances, one alive could be there with the dead until he also died. And think of the, the emotional tortures these ones had to endure before their death. You have the opportunity to see the cells. So they divided the church into two. They used the top as a soldier's mess where they were eating and drinking, and the down, the hall of trade where the Africans were auctioned or were sold. When the English came in, they converted the halls to classrooms for the police. As it stands now, it's a museum. The difficulty, however, is that you read through the New Testament side of the Bible, and you don't have any scripture to support the kind of brutalities they, they meted out to the people. And some argue that the verse of scripture suggests that the servant should obey the master. But that's where the difficulty is. The, the servant must obey the master, but the master is also aware he has a master. And the, and the, the relationship between will be loving your neighbor as yourself. And if that is the case, then you cannot hold the Bible responsible for the brutalities that took place in structures like this. So I tell people it is important you separate the book from the act of the people because the book never gave a backing to the act.
originally constructed by the Dutch. Soldiers were up there to look through if enemies were coming. But when the English came in, they converted these to prisons. This is where the king called Nana Akwesi Ajman Prempe I was kept. And this is where Queen Mother called Ya Asantua was held. Before taking to Freetown in Sierra Leone and from there to Seychelles Island. The king came back eventually in 1924 and died seven years later at age of 59. But the Queen Mother died over there. In the year 2000, during the 100 year anniversary, her remains were brought back and reburied in her hometown. So these were the prison for the, the royalties that were held in here as prisoners. And every space you see between the wall down there, every space there, before had a cannon in it. So all these had cannons to defend the castle from external attacks. One thing striking is this, where they place the cannons up to this end or this point, there are no rooms under. So you could see thickness of about 7, 10 meters as a thickness of the wall, what we call the curtain wall. Meaning that no matter the situation, you can attack the top, but you cannot bring down the base, a very solid base. The, the irony of the story, however, is the fact that just opposite is the Dutch church. At the time of the, of the Dutch, the governor could look at the church and still pick a lady to sexually abuse. These are some of the ironies of the stories. How they were able to put together is difficult to really comprehend. So this was the Dutch Reformed Church. That is to say that when the Dutch took over, they would turn the Portuguese church to a hall of trade and the mess, and then would come over here to build their church on top of one of the female's dungeons. The church was called the Dutch Reformed Church. Now, you look up on the entrance, you can see an inscription taken from Psalm 132. And what is there suggest? Zion is the temple of the Lord, and this is where he has desired to live forever. But just below the church, just below the church, is a female's dungeon, just below it. It was built by the Dutch in 1665-66 and was used as a watch post. So soldiers were put into this to take off all inland routes so that nobody could come and take them by surprise. We don't have to forget this. Before the Dutch took over, there was a bushy area. So it was there the locals assisted the Dutch to attack the Portuguese. So when they finally took over, then they built that for nobody to do the same thing to them as they did to the Portuguese.
Now, from the time all the countries in Africa started getting their independence, everyone had been trying to sort of reconciling the African people all over the world, one way or the other. In the early part of the 1990s, the chiefs in Ghana took up the responsibility. They had a ceremony here called Fihankra. Fihankra literally means that when you were going, you never had a chance to say goodbye. Now, after the ceremony, the chiefs went to the United States, had a long discussions, not only with Africans in America, but all other parts. And when they came back home, this came up. So whatever the reason for walking through the dungeons must be in the everlasting memory of the anguish of our ancestors. It should compel us to pray for those who died to rest in peace, those who love to return and find their roots, and that man never again be given the chance to commit such crimes against man, and with the living ought to vow to uphold this. So as, as you watch this and as you think through this, you, you make a vow to do the little you can do, ensuring that this evil will never again be repeated. I like what Dr. Martin Luther King said one time. He said that man's inhumanity to man is not only perpetrated by the vitriolic actions of those who are bad, but they are also perpetrated by vitiating inactions of those who are good. In other words, you cannot sit on the fence and cause a change. Do something little to make change possible. And they call this area Cabo Corso, meaning short Cape. This is the weather had been kind of corrupted to today's Cape Coast. The reason for putting up this structure initially was to trade to support Elmina Castle to augment the activities of Elmina. Therefore, in 1637, when the Dutch oyster the Portuguese from Elmina, those here in Cape Coast didn't see the need to continue their stay. In that sense, they abandoned the structure and left. In 1653, the Swiss took over the Portuguese remains, eventually demolished the wooden thing that had been done, and they put up a brick fort, and they called this fort or lodge Carol Osbeck. Just about five years into their stay in 1658, the Danes kicked them out. And about three years into the stay of the Danes, the Dutch also kicked them out. And in 1664, the English then kicked out the Dutch and stayed in this particular castle dungeons until 1957 when Ghana became an independent state. It was during the English time that they expanded or sort of reconstructed the castle to the size it is in today. Also, you must know that this place had been a pace setter in certain things. One, this was where the first primary school with uniforms actually began. It was from here that the English court system we are practicing here in Ghana also began. It was from the same place that the bond of 1844 was signed and to many historians this was set the stage for colonial administration in 1874. This was the first capital of the, the colony of today's Ghana until 1877 when it was shifted from here or moved from here to today's national capital Accra. It was also from here that the first prison service actually also began. So the structure standing now, if you connect it to the switch time, 
it could say that the structure is 366 years. The, the Swiss being here for five years, the Danes staying here for four, for three years. The Danes stayed in here for three years. The Dutch stayed in here for four years. Then English stayed in here for 292 years. I mean, 292 years, almost three centuries. And Ghana being the last group, we've also been here for 62 years in this year, 2019. And we keep counting. This castle or dungeons is basically known for this evil trade. And unlike Elmina, this was built to carry a thousand three hundred captives at a time. We had a thousand men and three hundred women. And one thing I would want you to take a particular look at is this. The flooring in the dungeon is not original from the time the English constructed the castle or the dungeons. It became original after the abolition of the trade. So the flooring you are seeing today is made up of food particles, sweat, blood, tears, human flesh, compacting together Feases, urine, vomits, compacting together to give you the flow you are seeing today. So as you see this, you're looking at the, the surfacing of the dungeons after the abolition of this evil trip. We have five compartments making up the male's dungeons. And every compartment had 200 people at a time. They also stayed here just like Elmina a month, two, three, sometimes before the ships would come. And unlike Elmina, where they were given containers where they could go to the toilet into them. Over here in the in the dungeons, they created a sort of canals where they could go to the toilet into them, supposing that the rain will wash these feces and the rest away. And sadly, because it couldn't serve the purpose, it started piling up in the dungeons. It was in 1974 that the archaeological department from the University of Ghana, Legon, did those archaeological works to help us see the real surface as it was built and what became of the dungeons after the abolition of the trade. Here there is a shrine, but behind the shrine was the tunnel through which the male captives would go through an underground tunnel from then on to the door of no return where they will be given out to the ships. You know, before we saw God in trees, in rocks, in river bodies, in water bodies and all that. So before the foreigners came, there was this thing called Nanatigri that the locals saw to be the God of the land. But when they came in to construct the, the, the structure of the castle, they cut a piece of it and took it out. And when Ghana took over, they brought it back to its original position. And so today we have it here that when people come in, they do accept the, the priest to pour libation on their behalf. And they will give a token also and invoke the blessings on them. That's good to say. Not everybody believes in it though. So those who do believe are given the opportunity to, to be prayed for. Walking on top where we have the canons today, underneath is the underground tunnel that the Africans exited. And going through that underground tunnel, walking about 78 to about 80 meters, they join into the females and then they exit together through the door we call the door of no return, where they were given out to the boats. 
Looking back from the door of no return is a door of return. And it's, it's significant in the sense that it was from 1998 that this became the door of return where the remains of two Africans who were enslaved had their remains brought back through this very door that signified the return of the Africans and that the chains of no return being permanently broken ushered in Africans back to Africa and to today many of them are living here as part of the societies the condemned cell we have over here is a little weird than the one we had in Elmina because over here it seemed as though there would not be any room for air and so people were suffocated in the midst of that pain hunger thirst kill them up you see the Maclean's Hall where I indicated became the first court system we had here in Ghana or the first place that was demarcated as a court for today's Ghana from this point we can see Fort Williams that was also built to protect the castle from land attacks and eventually also served as a lighthouse and just like Elmina we have opportunity see the governor's bedroom see the, the living room See the reception area. On top of this meal's dungeon, we have a church, the Anglican Church. The church was spearheaded by the Society of the Propagation of the Gospel. But as I indicated, you go through the New Testament, for example, and you don't have scriptures backing the wickedness they perpetrated to the Africans. So I always tell people. It is important you separate the book from the act of the people because the book never gave a backing to the act. Right at the center of the courtyard are three distinct graves. And you see one is separated from the three. The one that is separated was an African. And the three that are together are Europeans. Making you understand that even in death, they separated the people. This man called Philip Kwaku was among three that were taken to the United Kingdom to be educated to become Anglican priests to help in perpetuating or help in spreading the gospel here. Unfortunately, two of them died when they got to UK. He came back. And I say unfortunate on, on his behalf because he got married to a white lady that would not give him the opportunity to be speaking the fancy in the house all the time. So somewhat became more English than the English people themselves. In that sense, he couldn't evangelize the moon, but at least to his credit, schooling in Cape Coast became prominent that he will get the locals to be educated. He was born in 1741 and died in 1816 at the right age of 75. And of the three graves we have for the Europeans, we have one, the first for the, the man called C.B. Whitehead, who was a commandant of the castle and also a lawyer. This man probably died in one of the exchanges with the Asantes in 1812. He was 38 at the time of death. The controversial one is the lady Letitia Elizabeth London, 
who is supposed to be the wife of Captain George McLean, who came in 1838 to, to visit the husband, but unfortunately died only two months into her stay. What could be the reason? Some suggest he poisoned herself. Others also claim that uh, the, the man, George McLean, who had gotten involved with an African lady called Ellen Bannerman, kind of connived to kill the legitimate wife so that they will continue with their relationship. So the death of this woman still is controversial because they're not able to determine exactly what killed her. But of course, it was poisoning. But whether she did it herself or something was done to her is not yet known. Then we have Captain George McLean himself, who died in 1847 at the age of 46. This man is kind of accredited in ensuring that slavery in trade was abolished at the time he was around. He, he blocked the exit from the male's dungeon so that nobody would secretly continue with something like that. He also is responsible or the architect behind the bond of 1844. He is also accredited for being the one that introduced the, the English court system here in Ghana today. And then also for a reason I cannot actually detail it, was supposed to be loved by the local people because of his fairness. But it was buried down here. In 1847 when he passed so right here we have the females dungeons and in this castle Cape Coast of dungeons we had two separate for the female captives and each had 150 each making the number 300 women stuck in these rooms together on the floor just as you see it they were packed and were sleeping they were given food and water once, twice a day, a very little just to keep them alive. They stayed in this condition for a month to three months before the ships came. They were never allowed out. Until the time the governor wanted to pick one to be used, or there was an epidemic that would compel them to come out to come and exercise. Take a look at the floor very well. Such was it. And they were sleeping in it.
we should also know that at that time chiefs were captured spiritualists were taken the very person that's supposed to give protection to those who are going to war was himself captured innocent people were also taken so everybody at all could be taken again i want you to look at it from this angle a woman had two kids in say kumasi one day she was going to the market to get some stuff to take care of the kids what broke out every effort to go back home to take care of the kids failed she was captured brought to the dungeons here in Elmina. survived the brutalities here in the dungeons survived the brutalities during the middle passage and then survived to jamaica there she had kids and later on died never had the opportunity to explain to her kids how she got there today those in kumasi and in that sense ghana and in that sense africa are the descendants of the kids she had before she was captured and those in jamaica and in that sense diaspora are the descendants of the kids she had before she died so then both had their ancestry walking through the dungeons that gives you the opportunity to see each other as one whose forebear went through the same difficult situation that today some are in Africa and now some are in the diaspora. There are some people also who say that, well, why didn't the Africans come together to fight? You are correct. But don't fail to understand that these were distinct communities with different cultures, different languages that they themselves were not even having the opportunity to pull themselves together to see themselves as one people. So then pulling together to fight was by that a big challenge. They never had the weaponry to fight another challenge. But don't you think that they didn't do anything about the situation. That's a lie. Every step of the way, the Africans fought. Every step of the way, they fought. Communities built fence walls that would protect the whole community. So much so that if you're not part of, the, of, the, of that community, it will be difficult for you to enter and then come out. Just a way of protecting themselves and not getting into the radar of these evil people. Communities have to move from one location to another and change locations all the time, way of protecting themselves. So many trenches were made covered with weeds to trap those who will come after them. Every step of the way they fought. Walking down to the dungeons, several wars, several fights, several confrontations took place. They had to kill those leading them to come down. People had to be tied to the trees to be left to die to serve as a deterrent. Coming down to the dungeons, they had to fight. That's why in almost all the dungeons, there are condemned cells to kill the people to, to, to serve as a deterrent to those in the dungeons. On the way going, the, the middle passage seemed to be the worst leg of the journey. Had to see two out of ten ships, Africans revolting so greatly. In fact, the only difficulty in most cases would be the fact that they never had the skill to, to, to man these ships. Otherwise, several of them would have gotten to different destinations holding on to their ships by themselves. Severally, when they got to the plantations, the Columbus in Brazil, the Maroons in Jamaica will help you get an idea that having the least opportunity, they will move out. Even after we still are fighting. We still are fighting. Because the liberty for the African is not complete as at today. So we still are fighting. So don't you think that we didn't do anything about the situation? We did. 
why do I or why do we want you to have opportunity to watch this? And why do we want you, given the opportunity, come down to walk through the dungeons yourself? So that we will learn from the mistakes of the past. Try to correct them by way of taking an informed and humane decisions. So collectively we can stop those from reoccurring in any form in the future. It is true we cannot undo the past, but certainly we can affect the future. And how positively we make it happen will be our responsibility. There was a time Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said that an individual has not started living until he could rise above the narrow confines of his own concerns to the broader concerns of humanity. And I believe if you could step out of yourself, you can make the change better and faster. I also want to reiterate what Marcus Mosiah Gabi said. Marcus Gabi said that we may not all live to see the higher accomplishment of an African empire so powerful and strong as to compel the respect of all mankind. But in our lifetime, we can work and act to make that dream a possibility within another generation. So whatever we are doing today has a bearing on tomorrow. And what you want tomorrow to be, you must deliberately act it now. Let me also add, no matter how you feel watching this, no matter how you feel reading about it, no matter how you feel listening to it, it's not to be compared to you walking through the dungeons yourself. Touching the walls, smelling the scents, seeing the chains, fitting into the door of no return yourself, nothing is to be compared to that. So I encourage you to come if you have the opportunity so that together we can build those bridges that will see Africa in a different light. Thank you very much for watching and waiting to see you here.